Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nasrin Filsouf, and on behalf of the Canadian Iranian Foundation, it is my pleasure to welcome you and our distinguished guests today to this event. Canadian Iranian Foundation is a nonprofit organization, and one of its very, very important mission is to educate the new immigrants and teach them about life and culture in Canada. In fact, facilitate their integration into the Canadian society. Today, we are pleased to have this event in here, having the wonderful candidates here. I want you all to listen to them, and I want you to ask them hard questions, and then we'll see what happens. We are all going to vote on 19, October 19. Thank you very much for coming. And today, moderator is Kami Taimurian, and I'm going to give the microphone to him and ask him to continue the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Kami Taimurian, and I'm honored to be serve as a uh, moderator today is on a, our meeting. Uh, and on behalf of the Canadian Iranian Foundations, I want to uh, uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, I would like to thank you all joining us this evening. This uh, debate is key part of our democratic process, giving us the chance to hear directly from the candidate who wish to present us and to discuss the issue that matter most to the people of the North Shore. We have uh, um, eight, uh, supposed to be 10, anyhow, <laughs> uh, from different political party with us uh, today. Each of them brings unique perspective on the important challenges we face in our community from transportation, healthcare, public safety, and education. Tonight, uh, today, debate will give them the opportunity to present their solution and their vision for the future of a North Shore. As we know, this region is growing, and with that growth comes with opportunity and lots of challenges. Uh, today, we will hear from the candidate about how they plan to address the issues that directly impact of our daily life in a North Shore. Um, th this is your chance to listen and make an informed decision and vote. Now let's go over our, the rules for today. Uh, the, the, can, uh, the debate will begin with a two minutes opening statement from each candidate. After opening a statement, we ask four a question, one at a time. Each political party will have four minutes to respond to each question. Please use your time wisely to present your party's position on the issue. Once all the questions have been answered, each candidate will give two minutes for closing the statement. We have timekeepers here uh, tonight. Uh, we have timekeepers sitting over there, and they will raise the green uh, sign. It means that you can start, and a red sign means you need to close your statement immediately. We ask all candidates to respect to the time limit to ensure a fair debate, and we also expect respectful and professional uh, dialogue. And also, uh, I ask uh, for the audience, we ask to remain quiet during the debate and hold your applause until the end. Thank you again for being here today, and let's get started. So we will have the opening um, statement, starting with... Lynn Black? Good luck. Sorry. Sorry if I pronounce your names wrongly. Thank you. Salon Halle Toon Hubert. My name is Lynn Block, and I'm the conservative candidate for the West Vancouver Capilano riding. And it's clear from everything that I've heard in the community that it, this is a change election. I am an immigrant. I've lived on the North Shore for over 50 years. I graduated from here, my children graduated from here, and my grandchildren are in the community now. I have been a lifelong resident here since I immigrated. I am a teacher, background, education. I have 
taught elementary, secondary, post-secondary. I have a master's in education administration and the Prime Minister's Award for teaching excellence. Now I'm an elected school trustee in West Vancouver. Listening to everybody that I've been talking to, knocking on doors, what I hear in the community that your biggest issues are cost of living, education, health care, and traffic. What will the Conservatives do, very briefly? Address the cost of living, reduce taxes. For education, support parents' rights. Post-secondary funding reallocation, health care. We want to abolish Bill 36, and we want to make sure everybody has a doctor. Just to start. Traffic. Dust off the ignored report from seven years ago and revitalize it, review it, work on it. Why am I running? Besides running because of my children and grandchildren, I am running because the assault of the NDP government on personal and community autonomy, the deterioration of our economy, the high cost of living, and the concern that my children and grandchildren will have to shoulder the burden of this government's fiscal irresponsibility for years to come. I love the North Shore. There is no place like it to live, and I want to make this place better by being voted in as your candidate, Capilano, West Vancouver Conservative. Thank you. Uh, I have a suggestion, uh, maybe because it's an opening so everybody can see you better. Do you want to stand? Yeah, sure, I love that. Someone? Go for yeah. it. Sorry. <laughs> or, or wherever you are. I'll take the podium if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, that's better. So if any, there we go. when your time is ready, raise your green light. Yeah, I'll, hello? I look Persian, but I'm not. <laughs> okay. My name is Sam Chandola. I'm the BC Conservative candidate for, you can't hear? Hello? It oh. kind of too much, so that's why I'll, I'll be louder. <laughs> or is this better? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So my name is Sam Chandola. I'm the BC Conservative candidate for North Vancouver Seymour. I'm a technology entrepreneur. I'm a venture capitalist. And two months ago, I decided to run because I was very concerned about the state of our economy and our provincial deficit. Over the last two months, I've had many interesting conversations with residents. We go, we knock on their doors, we talk to them. My favorite conversation was when I knocked on somebody's door and they thought I was there to repair the refrigerator. They were very disappointed when I told them I wanted to talk politics instead. But the number one question I get when I knock on someone's door is, what do you stand for? They want to know more about me, my background, and what do I stand for? So I know we'll talk a lot of policy today. I know you'll have a lot of questions for me about policy. So I'll talk about policy in that phase, and right now I'll tell you what I stand for. I have five core principles, and any decision I look to take goes through these five principles. Number one is individual liberty, which is your right to live your life the way you want to, without interference from me, from, from anybody else, from any other political party, from the government, regardless of your race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, identity, ideology, or political affiliation. Number two is common sense. And for me, common sense means making decisions based on evidence instead of making decisions based on ideology. Number three is freedom of speech. It's a precious right in this country to have that freedom of speech, and we want to make sure that we defend that, especially when it's speech that you don't want to hear, because freedom of speech exists to protect speech that we don't like to hear, not speech that we like to hear. I may not always agree with my opponents, but I will defend and respect their right to say things that I don't agree with. <coughs> Number four. Fiscal responsibility, by which I mean stopping to steal. Oh, thank stop. you. Okay, and five is integrity and honesty. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Everybody see their name so they can come up. Do you need this one or you want to talk? Just wait out that. Let's try it. Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. Salam be hamegi. Salam. خوش اومدید اینجا من سارا افتخار هستم کاندید بی سی ان دی پی برای انتخابات استانی برای وست ونکوور کپلانو مای نیم مای نیم از سارا افتخار ایم دی بی سی ان دی پی کاندیدیت فور وست ونکوور کپلانو ام ایم گونا سپیک ا لیتل بیت مور فارسی دس تایم دیرز ا لوت اف آل کاندیدیتس میٹنگز وئر آی ول اونلی بی سپیکینگ انگلش بٹ دس از مای اونلی اپورچونیٹی ٹو بی ایبل ٹو سپیک ا بیٹ اف فارسی 
So, um, uh, من از uh, یکم از خودم بگم من از هشت سالگی با خانوادم اومدم کانادا Uh, من از کودکی اینجا خیلی اکتیو uh, بودم والنتیر کردم خانم نسرین فیسوف میشناسه منو از کودکی که چقدر اینوالو بودم به ب- کامیونیتی از کودکی احساس کردم که همیشه خیلی خدمت رو دوست داشتم دوست داشتم به مردم کمک بکنم به خاطر همین رفتم پرستاری خوندم uh, من د- د- پرستاری بودم رفتم توی آفریقا رفتم توی اکوادور uh, با یه پروژه با سازاملا کار کردم توی مصر و اینجا uh, به عنوان نرس کار کردم توی بیمارستان لاینز گیت و توی همین ارجنت کر um, هر چقدر که بیشتر کار کردم با مریضام و دیدم احساس کردم که قوانین اینجا باید بهتر بشه که من بتونم بهتر کمک بکنم برای مردم و خانواده من اینطوری نبود که مثلا با هیچی با هزی باشه خب مردم ما ایرانی بودیم همیشه یکم مشکوک بودیم با همه هزبایی که هستن اما من واقعا وقتی فکرشو کردم دیدم که NDP داره کارایی درستی میکنه توی دیرکشن درستی داره میره من خودم مثلا مهد کودک دخترم به جای اینکه دو هزار دلار بشه دیویست دلار شد من چون خیلی ادوکیسی می کردم من نماینده پرستارا نرس پرکتشنر هستم توی استان بی سی و می دیدم که چقدر قوانین باید عوض بشه و دیدم که چقدر اندی پی گوش می کنه به حرف نرس پرکتشنر به کسایی دیگه که هلتکر رو بهتر بکنه من با یه گروه بخشید بعد به حال در مورد پالسی من بیشتر حرف می زنم مرسی خیلی ممنون Yes, good afternoon. My name is Archie Carey. I'm candidate for the Green Party for West Vancouver Capilano. It's my pleasure to speak to you today from the unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam peoples. At this time, I'm running for the Green Party with a background in law. I've been a lawyer for the last 40 years. I have a BA from SFU in geography, and a law degree from UBC, uh, which I obtained uh, over 41 years ago. That said, law has given me a perspective on what it takes to make government work. Uh, without uh, a law degree, it's very difficult for many people to understand what actually takes place in the legislature, what actually takes place to make your lives work. And uh, essentially, I grew up in a family of commercial fishermen, and I've got a very sound uh, background in making sure that there's a sustainable budget uh, in everything that I do, and I intend on ensuring there's a sustainable budget uh, in the province of BC if I become your MLA. What I've noticed from the NDP is that their uh, deficit's increasing. This is very dangerous and very risky for our province. We can't afford to have that happen. I wish to ensure that we have a balanced budget in the future as I represent the Green Party going forward. Now, I've uh, found from being self-employed for the last uh, 40 years as a uh, lawyer, and from previously that, I worked as a commercial fisherman on my own boat for three years, that unless you can manage your finances, you don't have a future that can be financed in terms of health care, immigration policies, and other issues that are very important to our community. For example, we need to have a better means of transport on the North Shore. I think it's apparent to all of us that are in this room that without taking care of that, we're going to have a future that's going to become more complicated, and we have to work on that. That may involve a third crossing, as often been discussed over the last 50 years, or it may involve increased transit of some sort. That is one thing which I'm very much in favor of and look forward to bringing forward in the event I become your candidate in Victoria. Now, with respect to... Your time is uh, finished. Thank you. Uh, pardon me. Thank you for listening. Karen. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Corinne Salom. Uh, I am going to re- I'm going to refer to my notes here, so I will be looking down from time to time. Um, I'm Corinne Kirkpatrick, and for the past four years, I've had the honor to serve as the MLA for this community. Um, and I would like to thank the Canadian Iranian Foundation for organizing this in Nazarene. I think it's so important the work that you do um, in supporting and promoting uh, uh, human welfare and social reform and education. And this is a really important piece of it, so that people in the community can come out to get to know to. Uh, to 
get to know us so that you can make sure that what you're voting for aligns with what you want to see in government. Um, I'm honoured to have been the MLA uh, for the past four years and I have had the pleasure with working with some people in this room but many people in this constituency uh, and learning about the challenges and problems that people are facing here. So sometimes there are just individual issues that people are having that are somewhat unique that we can help them with but when we look at the broader community we know that the big challenges here are transportation, health care um, and, uh, and I'm not sure what this <laughs> sign is at the back there, uh, public safety and education. One example of the things that I've done in the last or something that I've done in the last term is that a group of, can a group of constituents came, they were concerned because in the British properties you know that there are racist covenants on your land title. Um, and so I introduced three times in the last legislature a bill that would remove those racist uh, covenants on your land titles. The NDP d would not debate that. Uh, and it's something I think is very important, but an example of listening to people in the community and taking something to the legislature. Um, just to tell you a bit about myself is uh, I've worked in real estate development, higher education, nonprofit management. I was the assistant dean of the Sauter School of Business. Uh, I was the CEO of the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia, and I sat on the Judicial Council of BC for three terms. I'm a chartered professional accountant. I, uh, I, I believe in fiscal responsibility and so what I've seen from this government is really terrifying in terms of its uh, irresponsible budget management. But what's also, I don't know what the red one was, was that done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. you'll hear more from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to take your notes because no. you'd be mad at <laughs> he me. Is so. yours. No, no, Thank you. Yeah. And I guess they're asking to have Did that. Use this? Yeah. yeah. Salam Bahamagi, Hoshalam K in Jahastam. Man Bowen Ma, Kondida, ABC and DP, Dar North Vancouver Lonsdale Hastam. Shoma Beman Rayid Madid. Hello everyone, my name is Bowen Ma. I have the had the honor of serving this community as your MLA. Since 2017, I'm the candidate for the BCNDP for North Vancouver Lonsdale. And in the time that I have had the honor of serving this community, we have gone through so much together. We've survived a global pandemic together. We condemned the IRGC for killing our loved ones through Flight 752. We stood as one for Zan Zendigi Azadi together for all of the challenges that we must tackle here in British Columbia, so do we also stand in solidarity with the Iranian Canadian community. I know that you still have loved ones at home in Iran under, suffering under a cruel and vindictive Iranian regime. I know that many of your hearts are split between here and your homelands. The Iranian Canadian community is a strong community here on the North Shore and we are stronger together. And my commitment to you is that in addition to my service on all matters provincial, I will always be here to stand with the Persian community. Merci. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Splett. I am happily married to Brenda Jane Splett. We've been married 26 years. We have three boys, 23, 21, and 18. The 23 and 21 year old are studying engineering at University of British Columbia. And our 18 year old, we just dropped off at the University of Alberta. Really quickly, I want to salute everyone at this table because I never have done politics before and I never realized how knocking on the door you get way to go or you get I don't care or I hate you and it's <laughs> and it's sort of like asking a girl for a date and she says never you so I have been working in the resource industry for almost 35 years I've worked as a chief financial officer for the last 20 
I've worked in the better part of 15 countries. I have managed staff up to 500 people, organizations up to 15,000. I am a cost disciplined person. I have had capital project and infrastructure management teams that have worked for me. We have managed probably 1,500 capital projects, somewhere between 50 and 100 billion dollars. The reason I ran is because by virtually every single metric that I've seen, our lives are becoming more difficult here. Incomes are not rising, cost of living is going up, housing is going up, fuel is going up, gas, all the rest of these. And being a financial disciplined person, I went through the books of the province for the last three years, I went through the budget, and I see a lot of things that we're gonna talk about today that should make people a little bit concerned. But I think there's a solution to these things. And my primary objective here is to keep my three sons in this province and all of your children in this province. The children are the future of this province. We need a healthy job system, a healthy industry, such that we can keep the kids at home, we can grow the economy, and we can leverage the resource business into a green economy. Thank you. Thanks, David. I'm glad to hear you give a shout out to the green economy. Um, I'm, I'm your, <laughs> not the orange economy or the blue economy. Uh, I'm your green candidate for West Vancouver Sea to Sky, which actually begins over towards Eagle Harbor and goes all the way to Pemberton. I live in Whistler with my wife and my twin 10 year old daughters. My, sorry, my name is Jeremy Valeriot. Uh, I'm running to represent you for the same reasons I first ran and was elected uh, as a councillor 10 years ago. Number one, I'm really concerned about the future for my young daughters. And two, I think we need more evidence, data, and facts in our politics and less politics. I'm an engineer by background, and I've spent 10, 12 years, spent a long time in the private sector, and then the last 12 years in local government. I believe in objective decisions for the good of all, not just a few. On issues, I'm running for regional transit for the Sea to Sky, which I'll tell you how that will benefit the North Shore later. Green economy. Uh, healthy people on a healthy planet. We've had a tough few years. People are hurting and having, having a hard time making ends meet. I don't need to tell you about the other crises that we face. Housing, mental health, toxic drugs, and the climate. They're all interconnected, and we need to solve them all at the same time. So I believe it's our collective responsibility to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren. So I ran in 2020, and I won on election night, and two weeks later, when they counted the mail-in ballots, I lost. There's actually some people in the Cedar Sky who still think I'm the MLA because they only watched that election. <laughs> <laughs> 60 votes out of 25,000. So oh, I, I, that's, I'm pretty motivated to, uh, to come back and finish the job. Uh, I've watched the Greens make an essential contribution uh, to our democracy and the health of our democracy by choosing serious, credible, and hardworking people to represent you. We stay focused on our core principles, and we're innovative, collaborative, evidence-based, and we're focused on outcomes. Uh, the leader of our party, Sonia First Now, is a deeply intelligent, genuine, thoughtful leader, and I'm really excited for you to see her shine in the leaders' debates. So I don't know many of you, uh, but I, when I get to know you in the context of you needing my help or my representation, I don't forget you. I'm committed to serving all the people of West Van Sea Sky. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so we're starting with the first question, and uh, we list uh, for each question which party need to answer. Uh, the first um, question, I guess you all have that in front of you, so you can go based on that order. OK, I start the first question. One of the major issues in the North Shore is ongoing problem of a traffic congestion, particularly when crossing our two main bridge. This has led to significant delay and frustration for, uh, for residents and commuters. Uh, what uh, concrete step does your party propose to reduce traffic congestion on the North Shore, especially during the peak hours? And how do you plan to address the long-term infrastructure needed to support, support future growth in our North Shore? So starting with conservative. Yeah, I'll start. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, I'll come here. Much better for you? Okay, sure. Because of the camera, they want to do it. 
So you manage the time between your groups. Yeah. So, yeah. so you can You can start. Who likes to leave their home after 2 p.m. on the North Shore? I don't, because we have gridlock traffic. I can't go down the street to the pet smart to buy dog food for my dog because there's a huge line of cars of everybody who wants to get on the bridge and I'm stuck over there with them. There's a two-fold traffic problem here on the North Shore. A west to east traffic problem and a North Shore to Vancouver slash Burnaby traffic problem. And both need individual unique solutions. The Conservative Party of BC is committed to infrastructure spending. We have committed to providing a billion dollars to municipalities that are actually engaging in infrastructure growth and that's funding that we want to use to propose building dedicated lanes for people in West Vancouver, in North Vancouver who want to go further east, or people on the east side in Deep Cove who want to come further west. A couple of days ago, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure released a report saying that they want to take away the lane, a dedicated lane that goes from North Vancouver into the east side into Seymour, a situation that helps everybody who doesn't live in North Vancouver and is going to Burnaby, New West, Surrey, but actually makes traffic problems much worse for us here on the North Shore. So, number one, get more dedicated lanes from the west to the east. We don't need to take the highway, we don't need to be stuck on ramps where people are going on the bridge just to be able to go to the grocery store. And that's what we want to propose. The second problem is our bridge issues. We have two bridges. Both bridges were built in the 1960s, and both are pretty much at peak capacity at this point of time. Here in West Vancouver, you have four lanes that merge into one on the Lionsgate Bridge. Over on my side in Seymour, we have people sometimes waiting for an hour, hour and a half just to get on the Seymour Bridge as well. The bridge needs to be solved in a couple of ways. One, immediate relief. We need to find ways how can we reduce bridge traffic by 10, 15% just so there's some breathing room for those of us who are trying to get on. And we want to propose solutions to use what we have. And what we have is the body of water. We don't need to build water. What we need to do is just get some ferries, some fast ferries that can get from the North Shore to not just downtown Vancouver, but Vancouver, Burnaby, and the regions beyond as well. This is not CBUS level ferry system. This is smaller ferries, faster ferries that run more frequently just to shuttle people back and forth and take off a little bit of pressure off that bridge. The second, is actually investing in our bridge infrastructure and upgrading it. Because it is now high time that somebody does that. The question that always comes, yeah, you want to talk about that? Oh, no, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. The question that always comes on that front is where's the money going to come from? Upgrading the bridge is three, four billion dollars. Where's that money going to come from? Well, I'll tell you, since 2017, the provincial government has grown 31% in size. All our tax dollars are now being paid to go fund the government. I don't find that I'm getting a 31% increase in the quality of the services in my health care or my education. The Conservative Party of British Columbia wants to come to government, wants to trim government so that we get rid of a lot of the excess fat and the waste that we have and redeploy that funding into investing in our infrastructure, in our roads and in our bridges to actually make life better for people here on the North Shore. Do we want to take that Real quickly, folks. When you're traveling, travel starts at the door of your house, and we've got Bill C-44. And let's say you live on a street with 10 houses. Did we? No? So let's say you live on a street with 10 houses and a developer decides he wants to take two lots and build six unit apartments on each of those lots. Immediately, you have doubled the number of families in that area. So your, your day starting trying to travel anywhere starts with having double number of residents in your community. Now you have a parking issue, now you have a transportation issue, and then you have an infrastructure problem, and then immediately what you're looking at is busing changes and quite a few other infrastructure tied to water, power, all these sorts of things. Last point I'd like to make is that there was a light rail transit proposal put to all the mayors seven years ago. This proposed a system where there would be a light rail transit from the North Shore into downtown. And so far, nothing has been done with this. So there is a solution. There are solutions on the table. We need less concept talk, less talking about platitudes, and actually do what they do in corporations, which means deliver on what you said you're going to do. Thank you.
text is end. Okay. Is the voice was clear when they used it? Do you want to use it or? Yeah. They said it's not good. This. It's not good. Can I try? What if I go like this? No. This is not good. This is not good. This is better, right? Yes. Okay. This is good. Thank you so much. So this is such an important question. It is so incredibly frustrating to be stuck behind the wheel when you're just trying to pick up your kids from school, when you're just trying to get to and from work. No, it doesn't sound good anymore. This is it, like this? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, gratitude to all of you for your guidance. So yeah, it is just so extremely frustrating to be stuck behind the wheel. My background is in engineering. I'm a professional engineer with an academic background in transportation. And it's always been incredibly important to me that when I speak about this issue, I come from a place of being informed on it and that I tell the truth. And the truth is, the solutions to traffic congestion are not easy. Any politician that tries to tell you that it's a simple solution are not being honest or they're being naive. Part of the problem with eliminating traffic congestion is that when we build more lanes for cars, we actually end up encouraging more cars to drive. And before very long, you end up in the same congestion as you did before. So it's a very challenging issue to tackle. The other key challenge is that our traffic congestion issues on the North Shore are actually directly related to our housing affordability issues as well. And I see some nods in the, in the audience here for that. Many people who work on the North Shore cannot afford to live on the North Shore, so they end up commuting. It adds to the traffic. So the solution must recognize both of these realities. No one project is going to fix the situation, but there are areas that we can focus on. For instance, we need to focus on building complete communities, and that means allowing people to live close to where they work, close to where they shop, close to where they go to school, so that you can walk across the street to Persia Foods to get a gallon of milk instead of going into your car for 20 minutes to go shopping. We also need to do the work that we are doing to address housing affordability so that people can live close to where they work and reduce the amount of commuting that they do. We also need to provide people with more choices about how they move around. Not everybody is going to be able to bike to work. Not everyone is going to be able to take public transit. But if we can make more those options easier, safer, more affordable for people, more desirable for people, then the people who can use those options will do so, allowing more space on the roads for other people to drive. Here in North Vancouver, We've added a new C bus, a new R2 service along Marine Drive. We upgraded the waterfront Lonsdale and Fitz Exchange, transit exchanges. We've made transit free for kids 12 and under, and we have been implementing the single largest investment in public transit in BC history, but there is more to do. And through my work to pull together a partnership of all three municipalities on the North Shore, so City of North Vancouver, District of North Vancouver, District of West Vancouver, the Squamish Nation, the tsleil Nation, the province and TransLink and the federal government, we're finally on the same page about the major projects that need to go forward for the first time in a long, long time. So we need to work together. And the BCNDP, we are committed to making the investments that are needed, that is required in order to push us forward on this issue. The conservative candidates have said that they will invest in infrastructure, and I believe that the local candidates have good intentions, but they are not on the same page as their leader, because their leader, John Rustad, who will become premier if they win, said just a couple of weeks ago that his plan was to stop spending and cancel projects. And that makes sense because he has done it before. A billion dollars for municipalities in a year only lands about $30 million for the North Shore. That is not enough to build rapid transit it is not enough to add east-west lanes. The BC Conservative leader, John Rustad, cannot be trusted, and you know this because his own colleagues, the ones who he used to work with in BC Liberal and BC United parties, like Corinne Kirkpatrick in West Vancouver, are running against him, and that says a lot. Thank you. Okay, next one. Yeah, green. 
So I know lots of people on the North Shore have heard about this phenomenon of not being able to leave your house with your car after, after 2 p.m. and it sounds terrible. Uh, contrast that, so I, I'm running for West Vancouver Sea to Sky, contrast that with having no public transit. You cannot get from Squamish to Whistler, from Whistler to Pemberton, there's, there's six bus runs a day from Whistler to Pemberton, only morning and evening. There's no public transit between Lions Bay and Pemberton. So that's a pretty abysmal situation, and that's one of the things that I'm running for. It's, uh, it's embarrassing that we don't have it, and we have 50,000 people in the Sea to Sky corridor. That has a huge impact on the upper levels and the traffic that, that you're seeing. So we solve that. We take part, part of the problem uh, away. The BC Greens have taken a pretty big swing at this and promised free transit and costed it out and it, it's, it is doable. Now that sounds, that sounds uh, radical, however, when you take into account that every dollar invested in transit returns four to the economy, uh, you see it as, as a really smart investment. So it allows people to participate in the economy, allows them to get to their jobs, get to their, get to their friends, and we've, we've promised to double the number of buses in four years and triple the number of buses on the road in eight years. It's, uh, transit is, is, an, is kind of an easy one. It's, uh, it's about affordability. Um, it's about, I don't know how many of you travel the Cedar Sky Highway, but it's often closed due to uh, tragic fatal accidents. Uh, there are you know, traffic jams all the time, and it's not a, not a reliable way to travel. So uh, never mind the, the emissions that, uh, that we're talking about. So I, I agree with, Ms. Ma, we can't build our way out of this problem. We need to think differently. Not not everybody can get around in a single in a in a vehicle of their own all the time. And um, so I I would propose that if you know if the Sea to Sky gets regional transit, that will that will help the situation. And then I know you've got many initiatives, including Sea Bus and potentially a, a, another another link. I just also wanted to bring up uh, longer term. A proposal that's on the table that's very expensive uh, and would need to be funded, but the potential of re-engaging our, our rail line uh, in the from North Vancouver to the Sea to Sky corridor, it uh, that would again free up a room on the upper levels because you wouldn't have people from Squamish and Whistler commuting uh, to the north to the North Shore in their vehicles. So. Long term, that that frees up potentially a rail line, a rail alignment for active transportation, and it could also uh, take much many of the vehicles off the road. And then I think you have probably the same issue with uh, ferry traffic coming from Horseshoe Bay. Those ferries need to become far less vehicle centered. So overall, it's it's a change in thinking from we have we have too many people to to all move around in in our own vehicles, and that's. That's an adjustment, and that's a that's a difficult thing to manage. And we, but we need to leave that room for people who have no choice, and uh, and we need to open up the, the we need to open up public transit for those who don't want to spend you know the average ten thousand uh, dollars a year operating their own vehicle. So that's uh, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, and I promise not to steal your notes this time when I leave. Um, uh, I'm running as an independent, and uh, when I do my closing, I'll talk a little bit more about the value of that. But what I have here is the ability to support good policy where I see it. Um, so I came here, and the questions are all, what is, your, uh, what is your party's platform on something? Well, my platform is looking at what is going to be in the best interest of British Columbians and what's going to be in the best interest of residents of the North Shore. Um, so I, uh, we have challenges here, and I agree with Bowen. Housing is a big issue. Seventy percent of the people that work on the North Shore cannot live here. Um, that means our teachers. Uh, but it also means our first responders. I was speaking to um, John Lowe, uh, a, a police chief here in West Vancouver. Eighty percent of police uh, police officers on the North Shore or in West Vancouver do not live on the North Shore. Can you imagine what that would be like if we had some kind of traumatic uh, uh, event? Um, we can't get our first responders here. Uh, so there are many issues that are connected to other issues. That's connected to housing. We don't have affordable housing for them. The, uh, with Jeremy, um, the commitment to actually uh, the sea to sky, having good transit, um, reestablishing a transit line, that helps us here 
in West Vancouver and North Vancouver because there's so much traffic that feeds through our community from people coming from Whistler, coming from Pemberton, coming from Squamish. Squamish uh, population has increased 30% in the last five years. And so that 30%, a lot of people are actually working in downtown Vancouver. So we are, as the North Shore, absorbing a lot of the traffic and issues that are actually coming to us from other locations. So um, when there was still a BC United, uh, I was working on um, a plan, a transportation plan for the North Shore. And I do still believe that it is viable and important. So I'll, I'll tell you what that was. Uh, a new second Narrows Bridge. This bridge is 60 years old. There's pieces of it's chunks falling off of it. There was a hole in it two years ago that we had to drive over for a, a few months. Um, a new 10-lane Second Narrows Bridge, which is going to feature additional uh, vehicle and HOV lanes. So we are adding lanes, but we're adding lanes in a way that is going to increase capacity vehicles to be able to use those lanes. Um, a SkyTrain connection. We have for so long been overlooked on the North Shore uh, by um, transportation planning. And when UBC gets a SkyTrain to it, where we can look at the North Shore and we can say there is a bigger significant economic and human um, argument that that could have been a project that should bring SkyTrain to the North Shore so we can be connected in to the rest of the Lower Mainland. And if you can get people with rapid transit onto the North Shore more easily, that is going to have a substantive difference in terms of the kind of traffic that we're dealing with. We're going to talk about health care in a minute, but I can tell you that traffic is a health care issue. If I have a loved one who needs to get to Lionsgate Hospital and I live in West Vancouver and it takes me 40 minutes to actually get over there, that is a health care issue that we've got. That means that we have to have more resources here. So this is a significant issue. We've got to take big action on this. Um, existing government and previous governments have ignored the North Shore for too long. So as an independent, I support good, good projects, but I also would have the opportunity to push and support the right things that are really going to help our community here. So I thank you very much for your time. So the second question, access to the health care in the North Shore remains a pres pressing issue with a long wait time to see the family doctor, a specialist and emergency services along with the shortage of the healthcare professional like nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, and etc. Additionally, mental health services are under a strain, leaving many without timely support. What is your party's plan to address these healthcare challenges, reduce wait time, increase access to the mental health care, and attract more healthcare professionals to serve our community? So the second question starts with the NDP. Is this okay if I tilt the microphone like this? Okay. Okay. Now, now you can hear. Oh, louder. Okay, I'll speak louder. So uh, everybody here pretty much knows that I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in the healthcare system, so of course, healthcare is a very important issue. Working at the urgent care, I know how important it is to have access to a family doctor or a family nurse practitioner. I hear time and time again that people can't get appointments or that their appointments are too short. So I know that this is a very pressing issue. I joined the BC NDP because, all the pro because of all the progress that they've made in, in health care. But there's still so much to do. So I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure and then the staffing and then what needs to be also done. So in terms of healthcare, uh, we've built a new wing at Lionsgate Hospital. We're going to have 102 new private units and uh, we're going to have eight operating rooms. Um, I'm just gonna say that a 
just what I said a little bit in Farsi. Man, chun nurse practitioner hastam midunam ki chagad mohemme kis society madam dash you know doctor kuna bade doctor dash ta bashan you know nurse practitioner dash ta bashan. Man khodam NDP ro oz shodam be khate in ki karay ki to health care dare mikone. Aval in chizi hastesh ki NDP karde damar de in chay ki sakhte sadu do ye ye unit jadi tu bi marsan lines get sak. که 102 پرایویت روم هست و 8 تا اتاق عمل دارد توی بی سی این دی پی 26 ارجنت کیر باز کرده که من توش یکی کار میکنم بی سی این دی پی هست اوپن 26 نیو ارجنت کیر سنترز و این ارجنت کیر سنترز و این ارجنت کیر سنترز و این ارجنت کیر ما یه دونه دانش... یه مدرسه دانشجو پزشکی درست کردیم توی اس اف کیو که قرار باز بشه نیو مدیکل اسکول سیستم نیو مدیکل اسکول ویل بی اوپنینگ ات اس اف کیو من چون نرس پرکتیشنر هستم یعنی من لیسانس هم گرفتم رجیسترد نرس شدم کار کردم و مسترز دارم یعنی میتونم الان نسخه بنویسم میتونم پیشنت های خودم رو ببینم توی آنتریو نرس پرکتیشنر میتونن پیشنت های مریض های خودشون داشته باشن کلینیک های خودشون داشته باشن و این این NDP اجازه داده به نرس پرکتیشنر که بیشتر بتونن کار بکنن و مریض های خودشون داشته باشن و BC NDP has expanded the scope of nurse practitioners like myself so we're able to open our own clinics without paying overhead, getting paid a salary so that we're able to spend more time with patients, which is really important. In terms of staffing, we've hired 900 family doctors, 6,000 nurses, and 1,300 international medical graduates. ما 900 تا دکتر خانوادگی تازه استخدام کردیم 6000 تا پرستار و 1300 تا دکترایی که از کشورهای دیگه درس خوندن که بیان کار بکنن چرا ما نمیتونن دکترای ما که تو ایران کار کردن و اینقدر سابقه دارن بیان اینجا کار بکنن اگه یادتون باشه هیچ وقت در مورد این حرف نزده بودن تا وقتی که NDP اومده از پارسال یه پروگرام گذاشتن که کسایی که دارن دست دست درس پزشکیشون توی کشورهای دیگه مثل ایران خوندن بیان تجربه بکنن یا اکسپیرینس بگیرن توی بیما... توی هیلث کیر سیستم اینجا ویو هایرد 1300 انٹرنشنال نیو گریجویٹس اند ہیو میڈ ایٹ ا لات ایزیر فور انٹرنشنال گریجویٹس فرام پلیسز لائک ایران ٹو بی ایبل ٹو ورک ہیر وچ از ریلی امپورٹنٹ فور گیٹنگ پیپل بیک انٹو اور ہیلث کیئر سسٹم و um, یه کاری که کردیم برای uh, برای داروساز ها هستش ما اجازه دادیم که پرسکریپشن ریفیل و و ماینر ایلمنتس ها رو فارماسیستا uh, uh, بکنن که یکم فشار از ارجنت کیر و ایمرجنسی هامون در بیاد وی و اکسپاند دی اسکوپ اف فارماسی سو دت دی ایبل تو تریت ماینر ایلمنتس از ول از دو پرسکریپشن ریفیلز اما خیلی کار بیشتر داریم کار مهمی که فقط میخوام بگم که به جای اینکه 36 تا هر سال جا داشته باشه برای انٹرنشنال مدیکل گریجویت ما کردیم 96 تا یعنی سه برابرش کردیم که دکترها بتونن بیان اینجا کار بکنن <laughs> Thank you. So we all know that uh, the healthcare system that we prize so much and that is part of our, our national identity is, is teetering on the brink. Uh, this government, to its credit, has, has shoveled a lot of money into the system and, and made some progress, but really without the outcomes that, uh, that we would expect to see from that kind of expenditure. So we still have and down from a million, but we still have, I believe, 700,000 people without a family doctor. Um, we, the, the Greens have a very simple and elegant solution to this. There we go. It has to be, why does it have to be held? It's horizontal. Um, a very simple and elegant solution based on the 93 MLA offices that, that the taxpayers currently pay for. We, would, we can use that to easily cost 93 community health centers across the province. And those would be centralized places where some of the, the roadblocks and the bottlenecks in our health system are taken care of. The, the, we have a, 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 a team-based health system in Whistler called Whistler 360, and we're very blessed to have that. And the, the principle of that is that when, when you have a healthcare problem and you walk into the Whistler 360 clinic, you're in the right place. 
So you can you have access to doctors, nurse practitioners, mental health, physio, occupational therapy, dietitians, pharmacists, all in one place. And so we we all know um, that the referral system is broken. We've all been in the situation where we've waited weeks. I spoke to an elderly woman at the door who waited six months for a referral uh, to to a doctor for a hip replacement. We we that what that can be fixed, and we know that can be fixed easily. We streamline that referral system, and there are there are issues in it that are easy to solve. And so we would uh, within these community health centers as part of part of that. Uh, clearing that referral system. Um, we know also that there are structural changes needed in our health system. I, the, the siloing that I've heard of about it, so in, in Squamish for example, we have the mental health section of Vancouver Coastal Health and the substance use disorder section are in completely different offices in, uh, on, in different parts of town. But that kind of separation of things that need to be integrated is needs to be solved. So as Greens we're, we're folks, at, you know, the whole system is focused on dealing with the problems as, as they become crises. As Greens, we're trying to look ahead, talk about preventative health and talk about mental health care. So um, with mental health care, six visits would be covered under a medical services plan, which we don't currently have. Currently, most people have to be on extended benefits or pay for it out of pocket. Uh, we would regulate psychotherapy, which is currently really unregulated and, and can cause a lot of risks for people. Uh, we would integrate mental health into, nine, into the 911 system and we'd call for a, a re review of the Mental Health Act. Um, I, I think that this is another, you know, the healthcare system is another example of where housing and cost of living are creeping into this. We, we may have the bed, beds, for example, long-term care uh, in Squamish and Whistler. We have the beds, but we don't have the staff. And so these things are integrated into people that can't afford to live in the communities that they want to work in, and uh, and and the cost of living, and as well as transportation. So it's it's another example of all these things being interconnected and intertwined. And uh, really, what's needed is a holistic review of our of our healthcare system. And I think that that is hard to do when you're just trying to patch patch up the the holes and and move lurch from crisis to crisis. In, in the meantime, 93 community health centers can do a lot of good in centralizing and streamlining some of the things that we're all seeing as, as major gaps in our system. Thank you. I get to restart. So I jotted down even more notes as you were talking. <laughs> And I'll start with this, um, knocking on doors, healthcare has been the issue that's been repetitively refrained to me, many people. I came across Kate, she had a hip replacement and my wife and I were talking with her and she said she had been waiting for two years for surgery and she had just been advised by BGH it'd be another 18 months after it. And might come. Yeah. Okay. Like a, like a so, like a K-pop star. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> like a K-pop star. So she said to me that she spent thirty thousand dollars to get her hip replacement in Alberta, and it was the best thirty thousand she ever spent. So the frustration is driving people to take medical tourism. There is a significant problem. I'll tell you something that we did learn over the course of the last month is one of our sons actually had a ruptured optic nerve and he was losing his vision, going blind, lost his color. And we started calling around frantically looking for a doctor and we got a referral to a gentleman on Lonsdale who works as an optometrist. And as it turns out, he's graduated from University of Tehran, he's got a PhD in ophthalmology, and he was outstandingly good. Except he has no pathway, no viable pathway, to work as an ophthalmologist in Canada. And he is one of 13,000 healthcare professionals, specifically doctors, that do not have a pathway in Canada. This is a solution that's been figured out by Australia, and yet we can't do it here in British Columbia. Tragic. The other thing is, is with not being able to use the skilled Iranian doctors and, and for that fact even engineers that don't have a path through our system, we lose the ability to maintain our ERs being open. 
the thing is, is that we talk about building a new facility at SFU, and the building's gonna cost us what? 20 million, 40 million dollars, and we should get our first graduate by 2032 or 2035. Does that solve our problem today? It does not. It does not solve our problem today. The other thing, we, we have a chilling effect going on with Bill C-36. What is B, Bill C-36? It's been brought forward by Adrian Dix and Mr. Eby, where they will amalgamate colleges and they're going to put into the legislation words around misinformation. And who dictates what is misinformation? Mr. Dix and the government. So what I have heard from innumerable chiropractors, healthcare professionals, is that this is a chilling effect on the community and doctors are actually looking to leave. So in the moment when we need more of these doctors, we are going to be losing them because Bill C-36 says, if you and me, patient and doctor are working together and we determine what's best for you. And Mr. Dix says, what I told you was misinformation. I can be charged $200,000 and go to prison for two years. This is a very big problem, especially when you're trying to tailor medicine to the patient. The last thing, let's go back to it. A doctor is running a business exactly like an electrician, a plumber, and a carpenter. He has a top line, he has to pay for staff, he has to pay for his office. And these doctors are not treated like that, they're treated like that, they're supposed to be some kind of angel that's willing to sacrifice all their income. They are sacrificing also because of cost of living in this province. The cost of living in this province is driven by taxation, the lack of provision of housing, and I'll tell you something, and I've heard it over and over again, is the ability to bring in skilled professionals to help these doctors. We know many doctors, we know many nurses who are leaving this province because they can make a better income working internationally. We need to bring our kids, our doctors, and keep them at home to train our kids for the next generation of doctors. But most importantly, let's not subvert and undermine what we need to do, which is solve the problem right now, today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, health care is a big issue, and so four minutes to re resolve our health care problem is, is not quite going to do it. So I'm just going to hit on some of the key things I think are really important on the North Shore, and then some of the things that we can do um, fairly effectively uh, to reduce wait times and, and some of the challenges that we're having right now. Um, so our current government talks a lot about how much money they've spent. We've spent more money than any government before us, and so that is not the metric of whether we have a successful healthcare system or not. Uh, when I was running my nonprofit organization, I didn't go into my board of directors and say, we've spent more money than we've ever spent before, but we have no outcomes. That's not how it works. And so I think we really need to start, or I know that we really need to start looking at data because there is not data transparency in our healthcare system. We need to make sure that we know where the money is going, but we also know where it is most effective because simply spending money doesn't mean we're spending it in the right places. And I do think that that's a challenge that we're having. Um, we have the longest wait times in Canada on the North Shore for, for walk-in, walk-in clinics. The longest wait times are here on the North Shore in all of Canada. And that should be very concerning to the residents here. Um, some of the ability to deal with that is, um, you know, our doctors here on the North Shore and all over British Columbia are asking for the introduction of physician assistance. And it does go to some of what the NDP has done um, in actually expanded scope of nurse practitioners, uh, the ability for um, pharmacists to be able to write prescription and make diagnosis on things like pink eye and, and things that you don't need to have to go and see a doctor and take some of that, take some of that um, blockage out of the system because you can do things much more effectively. Uh, we need more long-term beds here on the North Shore. Uh, currently Lionsgate can actually be over a hundred percent capacity on some days. There are seniors waiting in or sitting and taking acute care beds at the Lionsgate Hospital because they have nowhere to discharge them to. When you're over hundred percent capacity you then start to have seniors in hallways 
always in beds, again, waiting to be discharged. So all of these pieces of the healthcare system are connected, but we do need to focus on long-term care beds so that we can move people through the hospitals and make sure that they're getting appropriate uh, services. Um, uh, you know, uh, British Columbia, we've got 34, I believe it's 34 vice presidents in our healthcare system across BC. Alberta, with the same population that we have, has two. Uh, so again, we've got to look at where are we spending our money? Are we spending it efficiently? Uh, I know my colleagues in the uh, Conservative Party have talked about efficient spending. I don't want efficient spending to mean go in and start cutting. I want efficient spending to mean let's focus on the areas that we need to focus on and make sure that they are fully funded, but make sure we're doing it in an efficient way. I'll just finish with my own quick story. Three years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I'm fine now um, because we have a, a wonderful medical system, although sometimes it does take some time. Uh, but I had a kind of breast cancer that required that I had an MRI before they could do the surgery to do any more exploratory work. So I went on the MRI list um, and I just thought, you know, any of you have gone through cancer, you just want to get it out as soon as possible. So I did go for a private MRI. It took me four days to get in. I think I paid $700 for that. I was able to then go get the biopsy, then get the surgery. I was already recovering from the surgery before I got the phone call from the public system to get the MRI. So I was already through the system because I was able to access that one private diagnostic piece of the puzzle. So I do think that we also have to relook at how we are integrating some of those resources into the system. We're sending people to Bellingham. I think we have more capacity here in British Columbia if we didn't take an ideological approach to how we're using our system. Thank you. Um, I guess we should have a 10 minutes break and then I start with the other question because some of you have a question from the candidate yeah. so you can ask them directly until we start in 10 minutes so we have a quick break. All right, everybody. So uh, we're going to the third question. The third question, North Shore residents have seen, uh, I need, I guess, my glasses, I cannot read it. Yeah, North Shore residents have seen concern increasing in violence and a crime in recent years, affecting the safety and well-being of our community. What is your party's plan to address this riot in a crime and how you will be work to ensure that our neighbors remain safe for all residents while balancing the need for affecting law enforcement with the community-based solutions. So, uh, starting with the Green Party. Thank you. I'm going to take a different tack on this one and I'm going to hand it off to Archie. Um, kind of like what I said about free public transit, that's what the Greens are, are there for. That's what we're there for, to, to, put, to put forward solutions that maybe other parties don't want to talk about, but that are worth, worth talking about. In, the, in this case, I, I hear, I mean, I live in Whistler, but I listen to radio from the city, and I hear the stories about crime and violence that's, that are going on in the streets, and it, it, is, it is tragic and it's, it is compelling. Um, as humans, we, we deal in stories much better than we deal with statistics. So I don't know, I didn't, I don't know the actual crime rates on the North Shore, but I do know that there are a lot of sensational stories that, that make it into the media. And I also know that one of the things I dislike most about politics is the wedge issue that some, some candidates will say, we gotta, we've gotta lock these people up, they're, they're drug addicts and they're criminals, and I, and I really think that we need to be smart about this and look at the root causes. So. Let's let's talk about the root causes: poverty, trauma, mental health, and and really some some big scale social justice issues. When we turn to blaming blaming the blaming people who are in these the most vulnerable people in our society, let's let's go beyond compassion and think about that that the people who are suffering mental health crises could be any one of us. And really, uh, it's not our job to judge them; it's our job to treat them. So. In some cases, the criminal justice system is the right place to go, but I really think that the idea that we need to 
uh, public safety. I absolutely agree that we need bail, bail reform, but that's a federal issue. However, in leading up to this, I've heard the term catch and release, well, which actually a, a Kevin Falcon special that didn't work out too well for him. Um, but talking talking about catch and release is objectifying people to the to, in the worst way. As Greens, we actually you know try, we value animal, non-human animals, but talking about people like their fish or, or other animals is really the most dehumanizing thing we can do. So we deal in stories, but we really need to to think about the actual uh, statistical likelihood of being uh, of being hurt and think about whether that requires us to go and round up all the criminals and throw them in jail and lock away the key <laughs> throw away the key i know that makes good politics but i don't think it's i don't think it's good policy i don't think it's good for our society i'm going to leave it to archie who actually has a criminal law background and can fill us in how much time does archie have thanks jeremy yes. With respect to uh, my background in criminal law, that, that is to say I uh, have practiced criminal law for approximately 38 years. I haven't practiced it in the last two years for a variety of reasons, but uh, the catch and release uh, comment uh, that uh, Jeremy referred to, it's important to note that, um, uh, as indicated, bail is a, is a federal uh, area of jurisdiction. We have to lobby the federal government one way or another as politicians, as citizens, to make the bail process more strict. But I really recommend that all of you take a chance, opportunity to go to the North Van uh, Court and uh, go there on a, uh, what they call a remand morning, and uh, especially a Monday morning, and see how the bail process goes. It's a very thought, uh, carefully thought out process, and you'd be surprised about the kind of uh, analysis that takes place prior to a person being released. All of that said, I do pick up on Jeremy's theory and theme of uh, community. With a very uh, comprehensive community, we would have less crime. For example, um, I have Finnish heritage, and interesting enough, in Finland, when a person comes out of jail, they have a job. They arrange to make sure, coming out of jail, a person has employment. They don't just walk out in the street and become uh, another unemployed person. They have employment. That's part of having a community basis for keeping that person out of the uh, legal system. But uh, I wanted to make a comment about um, community further. I was recently speaking to a public health professor from UBC, and he pointed out that there are what's called um, crimes or diseases of uh, despair, I should say, diseases of despair, when people with little opportunity in life resort to crime, drug addiction, and other behaviors that are not very supportive of themselves or of our society. This needs to be dealt with by way of a system of helping them, keeping them away from becoming addictive, addicted to drugs that we all know can lead to uh, tragic deaths we're seeing here in the province. It would be important for us, I think, to uh, follow the Green Party policy, which is to help people with their addictions, and that would involve uh, Contrary to the Conservatives and the NDP, that would involve assisting them and making them aware of their problems and helping them through a process where they can become drug-free at some point in the future. The NDP and the Conservatives are currently looking at a policy within which those people would be faced with actually being forced into accommodation where they would stay at great expense to the community and our pocketbooks for treatment. That, it has been researched, doesn't work. It keeps people away from being interested in getting care because they know they're faced with a form of uh, confinement that is probably, uh, speaking as a lawyer, contrary to our Constitution. That said, uh, it would lead, lead to many, many problems, both legal and financial. So I would urge people to follow the Green Party policy with respect to those less fortunate in society, many of whom, unfortunately, do cause the crime we're concerned about. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is on. You can hear me? Okay. Um, uh, 
all of the issues that we are talking about today, they're all closely related. So when we're looking at crime on our streets, we're looking at uh, significant mental health issues. We're looking at the fact that we have a lack of um, supports, addiction supports. Uh, and so when people are, um, uh, you know, there's petty crime happening, there's a mental health out outburst happening, and people start to go through the criminal justice system. Um, they are released again, and there's nowhere to release someone other than back into the community. And so that is a big piece of the problem that we've got, is that we need to have more supports. Now, I was shadow minister for housing for the last four years. And housing is very closely connected and tied to our public safety. Uh, and the concerns that this uh, that this uh, group has expressed in terms of their own personal safety and crime in the community. I'll give you an example. Some of you may live by it, but the Travel Lodge. Um, which uh, is at the um, uh, Marine and Capilano. So I talked frequently to the Minister of Housing about the lack of supports for people that were being, and I'll use the word warehousing. I know uh, my friends in the green probably don't like that word, but it is warehousing people if you are not providing them with the mental health supports that they need so that they can get better and that they can be um, moved along from transition housing to somewhere else. So I was getting phone calls from the Strata Corporation, the people on Curling Road, which is right behind there. Suddenly they were having windows broken, patio furniture taken away. Um, there were a whole number of issues that started to happen in that community because we weren't housing vulnerable people properly and we weren't giving them the supports that they need. So in a scenario like that, it may not be the residents and probably isn't even the residents that were staying in that supportive housing at um, uh, the Travel Lodge. It's the kind of people that are coming to take advantage of them. So dealers and other criminals that are coming to that community that are trying to take advantage of the people that we're trying to help. And we owe, we owe um, people who are struggling with mental health and addictions more than what we're giving them right now. So again, this, this uh, you know, we, we can talk about bail reform. That's one of the challenges that are facing um, um, courts when they're having repeat offenders coming in but we really need to be able to wrap our arms around people and make sure that they've got more support so that they can come back into the community restorative justice also I'll just finish with that one is something that we do a really good job of on the North Shore and what we want to do is we want to take a step back and help people in their life before they go down a path that is destructive to them and is, is difficult for them so um, uh, some of the stores at Park Royal, uh, they have engaged with the North Shore Restorative Justice. They have shoplifters, particularly young people who are shoplifters. Uh, they will actually engage in restorative justice. They have a relationship with the policing um, and the RCMP where that young person doesn't get charged. They actually will go through a process. Their parents may be involved. And it's actually a significant deterrent to somebody reoffending. So we need to, to look at how can we take care of our young people so that they're going in the right direction and then how can we support people with the with the services and supports they need so that they will not be in a position where they feel they need to to they need to feed a habit and that often results in somebody committing a crime to do that so thank you Thank you. Crime and violence are not huge issues yet on the North Shore compared to other places in British Columbia, particularly downtown east side. However, EB and the NDP government have created a system whereby people with severe mental health issues are roaming our streets, negatively affecting our families, our seniors, and our businesses. And that isn't right. A conservative government will balance, will balance the needs of the most vulnerable in our communities along with servicing and making sure that the people with mental health disorders get the treatment they need. When I was uh, teaching, I had students who had mental health issues or home issues or drug addiction issues. I got them the help. 
that was primary. They needed the help, I got them the help. And that's what I think that we need to do here and now. Just give you a few examples. I don't know whether you know, but there was a, an independent film called Pandora. And it followed a gal named Teresa on, on the streets of Victoria. She is, she was, a heroin addict for 10 years. She's been sober for 20. She started her own agency down there. She's down there in the streets. She has to take somebody with her. Because what's happening is the government right now, they've got agencies down there, but they don't go on the, down the street. She goes and finds the addicts. She says, are you ready to get better today? If they say yes, she takes their tent, all their belongings. She gets them into detox. Then she follows them because she has to get them into a treatment bed. Then she has to get them into housing and then reintegration. That's what's missing with the program that's happening right now with the NDP. And we have businesses in West Vancouver, the West Vancouver and Dunderay Business Improvement Association just came out with their latest statistics and crime is up in those businesses and people visiting their stores are down. So it has affected crime and violence here because it spreads. I wanted to know, tell you though, the housing that's being built for the, the people who are having difficulties, mental health issues, drugs, on the streets. The housing right now is called wet housing as opposed to dry. Wet housing, I found out from Teresa, is where after detox they go there and live and they start taking drugs and drinking again. That is not helpful, she said. And she's an expert. She's a living expert on this. One example of proactive program is the Squamish Nation, right behind Staples. They have built purpose-built housing to bring their people home from the downtown east side. Drug addicts, alcoholics, mental health issues. Beautiful, beautiful apartments, and they have support. They have counselors there, they have drug addiction experts, so they are helped and improved, and it's working. So, what I'd like to see is more help through the crime and violence, um, so that we can diminish that, even get rid of it, in various ways. And the Conservative government does have a plan. What's not working right now is what's happening in the streets, and you know that. Don't have to tell you all about that. It's not working. We have to fix it. That's Perfect time. Oh, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. So my, um, my candidate colleague, Lynn, had said that a crime is not yet an issue on the North Shore, but then it was contraindicated by the fact that you said there is crime uh, on the, on the uh, at Amble side, or businesses are experiencing crime. But actually, if you look at the police reports, crime actually has gone down by 4.3%. So that's a good sign. And uh, random attacks have also gone down. So that's a really good sign as well. Um, but, you know, what has gone up is the amount of women still suffering from intimate partner violence and sexual assaults. Those, from police reports, those incidences have increased. And uh, what Haya have done as the lead uh, in the steering committee to end violence against women on the North Shore is for the first time set up a forensic nursing program at Lionsgate Hospital to help support women and to work with the RCMP for women who have experienced intimate partner violence as well as sexual assaults. And that was funded by the BC NDP as well as several other sexual assault centers. We've hired 250 police officers and we've worked to launch a new specialized team to go after guns, drugs, and gangs. Going after crime and money laundering and seizing criminals fast cars, luxury goods, and real estate holdings to send a message that the, a life of crime does not pay. We've also led the push to get the federal government to make changes to federal bail rules to keep offenders off the streets. 
the risk would be for John Rostad, where he cut the prophylic offender management program that was proven to, re to reduce reoffending by 40%. In a single year, he cut social housing investments by 75%, turning a generation of people on the streets. He also cut funding from crime prevention and victim services. I don't, as we have all agreed on, crime, to address crime, re requires a holistic approach to invest in housing, in healthcare. I just don't understand how you can do that by cutting $4.1 billion of healthcare that requires folks to be able to get treated. So the BC NDP understands that crime is still an issue and does not want the crime, the numbers to go up, but we're working on a solution that's holistic based, that targets criminals, but also uh, increasing social, social services to prevent crime. Thank you. Right. We go to the fourth question, uh, and after that, we are going to answer three questions of the audience. Uh, so the fourth question is, with the significant increase in the number of the students in the North Shore, there are growing concern about crowded classroom and its impact on the quality of education. Uh, what is your party's plan to ensure that our classroom have the resources, infrastructure, and support needed to maintain high quality education, accommodating the growing student population and support the teachers and the staff? Okay, starting with... <laughs> Thank you very much. I was hoping that my, my colleague Lynn would start because she has got the, uh, the experience of being on the school board. So, uh, But I did have an opportunity to, um, as a mom uh, on the North Shore, uh, my own experiences with having my daughter who went initially to Irwin Park and then she went to Cleveland and she graduated from Hansworth last year. And I will say that although we have crowding issues, I just want to um, uh, just say my, share my appreciation with the teachers on the North Shore and the school boards on the North Shore because they are excellent. The quality is fabulous. Now, I put that out there, but I will say, yes, we do have overcrowding in schools, which is a challenge. Um, I will differentiate a little bit between North Vancouver and the school district there and the West Vancouver school district. North Vancouver, the overcrowding is significant. Um, they are um, uh, required, I mean, there's been uh, very few new schools built. Cloverly is coming online, but it's going to be already over capacity when it comes online in 2026, and there's nothing else that is coming down the road. Um, as we see our community is growing, we need to be clear that we are actually planning our capital projects and our infrastructure along with how we're planning and estimating our, our population growth and the and the population growth at the point where we've got young people coming into school so um, communities in North Vancouver are generally younger families than they are in West Vancouver so West Vancouver also has some challenges it's not as much of an issue with the overcrowding and they are actually being able to take some of the students uh, across um, uh, from the North uh, from North Shore uh, School District to the West Van School District but there are challenges in not having enough uh, students in the school district as well it requires West Vancouver to rely more heavily on international students um, and the funding model from government needs to be changed because when you don't have the number of students coming in you start to fall behind on um, uh, capital costs and and uh, maintenance and you've got buildings and schools on the North Shore, both in West Vancouver and North Vancouver, who really are in um, need of having investment and in actually being replaced. One of the challenges uh, with West Vancouver is I think it's often ignored or overlooked by Ministry of Education because there is this idea that you've got exclusive schools here, uh, you've got high incomes, you've got um, schools that don't need the kind of help and support that other kids 
communities do, and that's just simply not the case. We do need to invest more. There's a disproportionate um, amount of funding being taken, or it's disproportionate the amount of funding that West Van is getting on a per capita basis for students. Now, um, in North Vancouver, uh, you know, over 200 students came into the system after September 30th of last year. And so what that means is that they are not getting any funding for those students that are coming in after September 30th. So if we don't change the way the government is actually providing funding on a per student basis in schools, it's adding additional constraints and, and challenges in terms of funding to make sure that you've got proper programs running there. So um, what do we do? Uh, we really need to make sure that there's motivation for government to invest in capital projects. Right now, if you are over capacity in North Vancouver, you need to add a portable. That portable comes out of your operating costs. We want to shift that back to the Ministry of Education so they're going to have some skin in the game in terms of making sure that they're properly planning the infrastructure and capital projects for their communities. Um, I have not heard teachers complaining about class size. Uh, sometimes there are challenges with uh, um, the makeup of the class and do we actually have enough supports for uh, young people that need more supports. I've done a lot of work with parents with kiddos with autism and there are many children out there who are actually not having access to education because they don't have the appropriate supports within the classroom that they need. Thank you very much um, and uh, I appreciate your time. Oops, no Yes, I'm a school trustee, and for some people, they say, how can you run for the Conservative Party? I run for the Conservative Party because we need more funding. I, the red herring is SOGI. SOGI, uh, we'll talk about that later. I'm sure I'll hear a question from the audience. But I want to talk about education in British Columbia right now. As a teacher, teachers walk on water. Teachers have so many challenges today, they are incredible. And yet we are short of teachers. Why? Because one of the reasons is they are not well paid. Beginning teachers in British Columbia have one of the lowest salaries in all of Canada. And of course, our cost of living is extremely high here. We need more teachers, we need more educators. Our school buildings, a lot of them are not earthquake proof. A lot of them have reached the end of their days. We also have issues with... We have also issues, children in care are not funded. Children in care are not funded. Government funding for school districts, and I want to talk about there will be overcrowding in schools, but because we are not allowed to have more students in a particular class or more designated students in a particular class, that's not the issue, but overcrowding in schools, that's when the portables come in. The NDP promised Surrey School District that by 2020 they would not have any more portables. Right now, in 2024, 7,000 students in Surrey are in portables. That is unacceptable. We need to have more schools built. But more importantly, they have to be more than just standalone schools. They have to be integrated moving forward so they can be other things as well to help adults in learning. Whatever it is, more capacity. Funding should be throughout the year. I don't think people understand that our funding from the ministry gov government comes out September 30th, we count the number of students, ones that are designated, et cetera, et cetera. We get funding per student, but it, it differs between different districts. That funding stop is given to us, but when we have more students coming in throughout the year, there's no funding for those students. Surrey has hundreds of students coming in a month. We have extra students who come, they immigrate or they move, there's no funding for them. So where does it come from? Well, it might come from resources. It might come from uh, having a teacher gone. It may have a program dissolved simply because there's no funding. So funding should be all throughout the year. As the students come in, the ministry should be giving us money. 
I think we should focus on what is really important here in education. We have good school districts in both West Vancouver and North Vancouver. But to continue that, we do need the money. We need to put the money so that our students are really well prepared for life, for what's happening out there. It's a changing world, as you well know. We want them to be educated, to be really good citizens of this world, and to be able to help with all the issues that are coming down, whether it be climate change, whatever it may be. So what I'd like to see, very importantly, is increased funding for our children. Thank you. Bakshid, can you hear me? Yes. Education is so key to our children's futures. It is one of the most important services that a provincial government funds, and it is a great equalizer in our society. No matter what your family background is, how much money you make, or if your parents were educated or not, as a child here in this province, you need to have a chance, or you can have a chance to change your life for the better by being well educated. My little girl, Azalia, is only 10 and a half months old right now, and even though she's so young, I can already see how much she wants to learn. We all want our children to thrive, succeed in life, and education is so important. That is why, as MLA, I've been working with our BC NDP government to increase funding for schools and education through all of our last seven years in government. We hired 5,700 net new teachers and have achieved the smallest class sizes in a decade. And that means that our kids have more space to learn, more attention from teachers and educators than they ever did before. And there is more to do. We also expanded, seismically upgraded, and built new schools. 125 school projects across the province so far, and six of those projects were in North Vancouver. Argyle Secondary School was rebuilt and opened while I was in MLA. Hansworth Secondary School was rebuilt and reopened while I was in MLA. Mountainside Secondary School received much needed seismic upgrades, which actually made the District of North Vancouver, or North Vancouver School District, among the first in all of BC to have all of our high priority seismic projects completed. With the help of Susie Chant in North Vancouver Seymour, we're expanding Lynn Valley Elementary School. We're expanding Westview Elementary School. And I'm especially proud to share that we will be building a brand new Cloverly Elementary School, a school that was closed when John Rustad was in government. We introduced new restrictions on cell phone use in schools so that kids can focus on learning. We're providing more school meals and launched an affordability fund to help family with costs. And we're building playgrounds at elementary schools for the first time in decades instead of leaving parents to pay for it themselves. All of these approaches are different from the previous government that John Rustad was a part of. John Rustad is now the leader of the BC Conservative Party, but for decades, he was actually a part of the former BC Liberals, also known as BC United. And when they were in government, they cut schools. His plan for cuts would mean canceling new schools, firing teachers, increasing class sizes. In fact, he's actually said that he would put more students into each classroom. And we know that he would do this because he has done it before. When he was last in government, he closed 267 schools in BC. They fought teachers all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada to try to crowd even more students into classes and suppress teacher wages. They froze school construction funding for eight straight years while population grew, creating a huge deficit in school infrastructure. John Rustad might be leading a party with a new name, but when he was last in power, he cut schools and we can't trust that he wouldn't do it again. It is too risky. With all the progress we have made here in North Vancouver, we can't risk a John Rustin government. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the North Shore school situation because as I've explained, I, I'm 
barely touching. We've got Rock Ridge Secondary and I think two or three elementary schools within West Vancouver Procedure Sky. I just want to point out that education is, is an investment in our future and it is the height of fiscal responsibility to invest in something that pays off in spades. So my children are, are in grade five, late French immersion, my daughters, and I am blown away by the quality of the education they receive from the public system. I think it's a true sign of our evolution as a species and how much education has improved and, and how, I mean, how far we could go with it, but also how much we need to invest in it. So I'll just tell you very briefly about the BC Greens education platform. It's not, we haven't released our platform yet, but I'll give you some of the points in it. One is mental health supports. We all know that, uh, you know, the education <laughs> component and the curriculum component are quite strong, but these students need need support in mental health more and more. Uh, climate anxiety is one, one small piece of that. Uh, another piece is laptops for all middle and high school uh, students. The, we've, we've now have uh, issues around electronic devices in schools and, and they've been removed, but they still need to be digi digitally literate to learn. So give them laptops that are not connected, that they're, they're not able to communicate outside, but they, they can still learn on so that they're digitally competent. Uh, universal school food program. We all know kids can't uh, can't learn if they're not if their stomachs aren't full and they're not well fed. And a digital learning secretariat. That's so. I, a good friend of mine is a principal of a school, and he came back from a, an, a workshop on artificial artificial intelligence uh, with his mind absolutely blown on what what this is going to mean for the for the change in our society, but how much our kids need to be. Uh, need to understand it and be be literate literate in it. So there are there are many changes coming, and we need to set up our kids to be ready for them. Uh, yes, I mean we need to pay teachers. We should be paying teachers certainly as much as engineers and maybe more. Uh, and and we need to invest in schools. That's there's nobody's going to tell you differently. But I think we do need to view it from a, a fiscal responsibility lens. Cutting cutting education is probably the worst. Thing that that any government could do, it has it'll have effects for generations and and do a lot of damage. We need our kids to be educated for the knowledge economy. We're not going to be a resource economy forever. We need to be a knowledge and information based economy, and those and the children need to be educated in that way. So, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, all four questions was answered. So we start with the three questions, one from each person, and then uh, each uh, political party, each table, have a two minutes to respond. We are starting the answer from conservative, NDP, Green, and independent, and we can rotate for each question. So uh, do you, yeah, you can start here, yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Stephen. I'm uh, a parent uh, and a teacher in uh, Capilano Riding. Um, my kid recently told me that he was gender fluid. That makes me absolutely scared as a parent because this world is not very kind to people like him. I read the Conservative Party's platform last week, and it's no longer there this weekend, but they had two school priorities. One was to make sure that school vouchers were a thing so that we're taking money away from public schools like mine and putting it into private schools. The other was that they need to stop indoctrinating kids in schools. I have my professional standards here. It is a breach of professional standards to indoctrinate children in schools. If that is one of the top two priorities for the Conservative Party, then you're saying that the whole system is in breach of its professional standards. So for the Conservative candidates, what is your evidence for that? And for the rest of the candidates, how are you going to protect my child's ability to see himself represented in his school library, in his classroom, to make sure that he or she, depending on the day, is not discriminated against in his school. Thank you. Okay. 
Of course we treat all our kids to treat others with respect. That's, that's fundamental, isn't it? And so one of the things that I've heard at the doorstep over and over again is about bullying in school. And then I did a little research on bullying, and the number one source of bullying is on physical appearance, then race, religion, culture. So there's other elements of bullying involved here. It's not just one. There are multiple issues here. And if we were truly concerned about bullying in schools, we'd put all the kids in uniform because they would all know they're on the same team. That's what they do in, in international schools, and that's what my kids have been subject to. But let's talk about SOGI just for a second. Of course you treat other people with respect. That is, that is for certain. But I think there's one thing that a lot of parents have said on the doorstep is in grade seven, teaching a kid that you're on the cusp of sexual consent and that you can have sex with people. That's when, a lie. That's no, true. Yes, so no, so then there's a, a No. So then have a conversation, talk to me. Okay? We'll talk That's about. true that I have a kid. Okay. We also Absolutely. have kids here. Please. Absolutely. They started, but please, great please, please. Okay, let's, let's, let's just... That is not a lie. Okay, you can I'm say something. Okay. Let's just wait. Okay. Okay. This okay. candidate yeah. gave their opinion. And we, then can, we can argue about this afterwards, folks, okay? The concern that parents have had is about the sexualization. Of course, you treat people with respect. They're concerned about sexualization because the parent and the family has been effective for 4,000 years, and the family is the core of our society, and parent rights should be supreme. So if they don't want their kids subject to courses and classes about sexuality, they should have the right to opt out. Full stop. So, hey, hold on, hold on, stop, stop. Okay, one last thing, okay? Let's, let's just have kids be kids. Let them be children, right? Let them go through life. Let them grow up. And, you know, when they're 15 and 16 years old, we can go back to it. But there's one last point I want to highlight. Our PISA scores have dropped 20 points in the last five years. That's us losing one full year of education relative to the international standard. We should be focusing on STEM, our math, our reading, our arithmetic, communication. Right? We're not here to change the world. We are here to give them critical reasoning skills. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You know, Stephen, I hear in your voice um, how much love you have for your child. You want your child to be safe and you want them to be safe even when they're at school where when you might not know exactly what is happening. You want to know that teachers are teaching other people not to bully them. You want them to be happy, you want them to be fulfilled. Every parent who raises concerns about their kids wants the same thing. You all want your children to be safe, no matter who they are, how they dress, who they love, who they are, who they, uh, where they come from, what religion they are. That is what we believe in, in the BCNDP. That no matter who your child is, that when they go to school, they are not facing bullying. And that is what we are committed to ensuring is in place for, for teachers to teach kids not to bully each other. You're absolutely right. It's not about indoctrination. It is about keeping people and children safe. And if you are a parent, who are concerned about uh, your child learning uh, about sex ed, which is, by the way, a different program, you can actually take them out of school. You can already do that right now. Okay? It is already an option to you. So if you have concerns about what your, what your kids are learning in school, talk to your teachers, talk to your principals. We're all in this together. We are all here to protect our kids. Thank you. This, to me, is an example of the, I mean, you, you can see the emotion in the room, some pretty polarized politics, and kids are being treated as collateral in, in this, and I, 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 don't think it's, I don't think it's right. I will, I will tell you BC Greens support inclusivity at, at every level, and one of our core principles is respect for 
diversity. I, I have 10 year old twin daughters. I am, yes, I am scared too of what, uh, what's about to come uh, as they get one or two years older. I would suggest that the, you know, the sexualization, the sexualization um, impressions that they're getting are coming from the broader society and, and not that much from school. And it's not to discount that that could be happening in, in some classrooms and that's, that's unfortunate. And as was said, Parents do have the ability to pull their pull their kids out, but to use it as a wedge issue to to create the the kind of heated uh, complete disability complete inability to agree on everything is I think very dangerous for for us as a society. So I think we need to yes we need to work hard on on avoiding bullying, but we we certainly can't have children bullied because of their gender gender identity or any other reason. Uh, but we at the fundamental, I mean, uh, one of my favorite parts of this campaign is the BC Greens have a button. It's our official policy is love. And to me, that is one of my favorite things because that's what's important. We, we need to love these children for who they are. And as adults, we don't have the right to, we have, we have certain rights to pull our parents out, things that we're, we're not comfortable with, but uh, we do not have the right to use our children as pawns in a political game. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everybody who spoke before me. This is very personal. I can feel the emotion in the room as well. Um, uh, if you look at the number of young people who are street entrenched, there is a disproportionate number of those young people are in the LGBTQ community. And part of that is because their parents don't understand or support the changes that they are going through as they're trying to learn about themselves. Um, so, uh, Soji is again, it's it's the, this word that people, or this term that people throw out, but it's a, it's a, it's a module, it's not a requirement, um, and I do believe that parents have to have choice in terms of what their young person is studying in school. So, if you don't want your child in sex ed, if you don't want your child in SOGI or whatever, I think we need to rebrand it to give a better idea of it's really an anti-bullying program. If you don't as a parent want your child to participate in that, I think that's that's perfectly uh, legitimate, um, is that you should have as a parent the ability to understand what's being taught in school, to be involved in that school as much as you wish to be, and to make sure that you're comfortable um, and that what your child is learning is in line with your values at home. They might be religious or cultural or, and we have to respect our young people are all unique and different. Our families and our parents are all unique and different. But I just don't want to throw something out that may have some real value and to make sure that we are, um, our children are seeing themselves in the books that they're reading and the conversations that are happening in schools. Uh, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that parents can't be in involved and participating in those conversations as well. So it's a it's a tough issue and it's one of those ones that, uh, that I just worry that we don't throw out the good stuff um, by maybe some of the misunderstanding about what really is an anti-bullying program. No go for the second question. I don't need that, I'm loud uh, enough. Uh, um, been waiting for this moment for almost two years. My question uh, is from you. Bueno. We can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you from the back. Right. Sorry. So I said I've been waiting for this moment for almost two years to ask one or two questions from Boima. Number one, it was a beautiful opening statement, putting IRGC had it. One question you can ask, sir. No, I've been waiting two years. I have to ask my question. <laughs> okay. yes. yeah, Putting IRGC into terrorists had nothing to do with BCNDP or you or actually federal. That decision was made in a room in Ottawa 48 hours before uh, IRGC was put into terrorists, and I don't remember seeing you in that room. Number two. Two. And one is safe. No, just one person. No, two. 
Everybody has tried to bump questions. I've been waiting two years. Okay. Can you just move on please for your question? Yeah. You previously uh, met with the representative from the uh, Qadir Cultural Center, which has ties to both IRGC and Hezbollah, both designated as a terrorist organization under, under Bill C-350. You wrote a support letter regarding this center in the Legislative Assembly. Following that letter, individuals you supported began uh, harassing members of the Canadian-Iranian community through physical attacks and threats. Despite our multiple requests to meet with you, you did not respond. This raised a serious question concerned and concerned about your engagement with them, especially for constituents who fled extremist regime. Many Canadians, Iranians, many Canadian Iranians claim that Qadir Cultural Center operates as a political branch of Islamic Republic regime in North Vancouver. Given the evidence that they are 100% connected and receive funding from Islamic Republic, Islamic Republic regime, why didn't you conduct th throw investigation into this center before issuing your support statement? Here is my proof that Qadir Center is 100% connected to IRGC. Hold on a second. I'm not done yet. Two years. Twelve times I asked you to meet with me, you didn't. You can't say you don't know. Me too. You restricted us from social media. Actually, she blocked us from her social media because we asked the right question. As you seek re-election, considering your relationship with the Qadir Cultural Center, how will you ensure transparency and accountability regarding your association with groups connected to IRGC and Hezbollah, which is designated as a terrorist organization in Canada? We feel like we need someone who is responsible for their actions, and that person is not you. You have shown that you could not be trusted and accountable for your actions. So first off, uh, for anyone who is a constituent of North Vancouver Lonsdale, know that my doors are always open to you. You can email me at my MLA office, you can call and leave a message in my voicemail. But because I also serve as a ministerial, uh, as a Minister of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, it does mean that my office has to prioritize requests from local community members, North Vancouver Lonsdale, which is about 60,000 people. So in order to ensure that I support people who have been, uh, who are, who have le elected me as their local MLA, they do receive priority. So when you email me, give me your address, we'll bump you to the top of the list to make sure that we respond to you. The Iranian regime is a cruel and vindictive regime. They have committed human rights violations against their own people. They have uh, committed crimes against their people. When they shot down Flight 752, that was absolutely unacceptable. We lost people in that flight, people who lived in our community. We lost people in that. When they killed Masa Amani, they murdered her for her choices I, it wasn't even a choice, she just had a little bit of hair showing underneath her hijab. Sorry, can you answer the question? The answer my question. This is, really this is the you answer. Can this statement? Yeah. This answer is, the question, please. This is you my answer. This is a statement for a terrorist organization. You supported them. There you go. Here you go. Answer the question, please. So, when it comes Here is the proof that they are connected. No, she has she, to answer my let question. You, this She's is right. She statement. let you, she let you just finish. Yeah, she has to answer my question. question. Of course. She, that's she's she's right. doing. She's doing. So I'm making very clear what I think of the IRGC and what I think of the Islamic regime. They are not welcome here. If you have evidence of those right kinds there. of connections then they need to go to the police because that is where these investigations take place. You need to submit this to the police. If you haven't done so already, then it is irresponsible to hold back that evidence. If you have evidence 
that there are organizations here with connections to the Islamic regime, you need to submit it to the police, and they need to take that seriously. But when it comes... It's nothing to do with parties. That's exactly nothing to do with parties. And going to the next question, please. Okay, everybody, hello, my name is Sam. Uh, first of all, with respect to all, all candidates, uh, uh, my, I see the first time the some the policy of the Conservative Party today. But I mean, this is not right. I like to know how government increases 40% of the cost of uh, uh, pay, uh, Canadian t uh, taxpayer. Here it's, it's mentioned. This is not true. I like to prove it for me. And we then, um, the yeah. When, yeah. when he mentioned the policy of the conservative uh, NDP increase forty percent of uh, tax for people, I'm on this, uh, I don't understand. I need the reason. I need the support. Please show me the proof. Second, second question. When you say. Uh, working for people. I like to know who are the people. People are middle class, high class, rich people. Where are they? Because the term of people is confusing. When you say that that we vote for people, but the, con the candidate that I vote is how much they prove that they are honest, that they want to sacrifice for, for people. When I see your resume, when I say that you work for uh, multi-billion dollars companies all the time, right? How you can spend time for me? How much time you did volunteer job for community? I like to know. That's my question from you. Thank you. Okay. If you want to know about sacrifice, as you can probably imagine with me having worked as a CFO for the last 20 years, I've set aside a fairly lucrative career to do this. And just like everyone else on this panel, there's a sacrifice to being up here. So when you ask the question, you know, what have we done for the community? I'd say I've sacrificed a whole lot to be here today. The second thing is, if you take a look, if you, if you take, let me finish. If you take a look at the C.D. Howe or Fraser Institute, it is widely published, it's in the press today, that there is 43% tax on Canadians. And in fact, if you go back to the financial statements of the government of British Columbia in 2022-23, the overall taxation revenue from the government has increased from $32 billion to $49 billion. That's a 50% tax increase. People and corporations. Okay, so when you're asking the question about taxation and that whether governments are taking 40 or 45 percent of taxation, just go into Google, take a look at Fraser Institute, that's widely published, that is between income tax, PST, GST, excise tax, carbon tax. I need to send it to me, you to, to everybody. I need go to into Google, to go into Google. Because it's general, there's not a statement for two, okay. uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. Let's get your email address, and I'm happy to send it to you. Thank you very much, everybody. Since uh, our time will be finished in this room at 5 p.m., so we have only 15 minutes. Uh, we're going through the closing uh, statement. If we have a time in the end, then you can ask a question. But we need to go uh, through the closing statement. Each uh, candidate have a two minutes to speak. After that, if there is a time, we can ask a question. But because we need to make in this room at 5 p.m. So uh, uh, starting by the name, they have it. You have the name in front of you. So let's start the Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here today and listen to all the candidates speak and uh, to hear the uh, questions be put forward. I've been living on the North Shore off and on since 1953 and in this riding of West Vancouver Capilano since 1990. 
I know the problems that exist, and I've been discussing them with my fellow uh, citizens for decades now. So I believe that I can best serve the constituency of West Vancouver Capilano, given my background. Now, it's fair to say that the Green Party is the party seen by most of the population in British Columbia that can handle and take care of environmental issues. That was a recent poll done and put on Global News in the last week. Now, one might think, well, climate issues, how does that relate to me? Well, there are many ways in which it relates to you. For example, it will affect your house taxes as we have to increase the infrastructure necessary to deal with risk of fires, increased flooding, and so on. Your property taxes will have to go up. There's health issues as well. As we all know, there's more ticks in the woods and probably even in your garden. Lyme disease is becoming more prevalent. Also, as time goes along, insect-borne diseases will increase from mosquitoes as the climate warms. Property insurance. Some of you may live very close to a forest as I do. There's a risk of insurance companies saying no insurance for you because you have too high a risk of a forest fire damaging your property. It's taking place in the Okanagan and taking place in the California right now. So climate is very important and I sincerely hope you'll consider the Green Party and myself when you vote this coming October. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I should also mention my colleague, Susie Chant. She's the BC NDP candidate for North Vancouver Seymour. She wanted to be here today, but she was needed for a uh, event with David Eby. And at that event, uh, it was actually announced that if we are re-elected, uh, the BC NDP will issue a working class tax cut. I'm learning about this now too. Uh, we will double personal income tax exemptions right across the board for all working people. So that was just an So now with, with that piece of news, update aside, I do want to speak directly to the Iranian Canadian community because it, this is a wonderful event put on by Nasrin Bil Souf and the Canadian Iranian Foundation, really stalwarts of the community here. You know, the community contributes so much here to the North Shore, to British Columbia, and yet for so long, for far too long, the Persian community did not receive the respect and the acknowledgement that it deserved from Canadian governments. It was not until the BCNDP formed provincial government in 2017 that official government documents started to be translated into Farsi, that Persian media started to get invitations to announcements, that Farsi was spoken in the chambers and that Nowruz was celebrated in the BC legislature. BC government elected officials started to attend community events to stand with the community against the Iranian regime to condemn the murder of Masa Amani. It was the BC NDP that initiated the memorial that is going to be built by the city of North Vancouver to commemorate the victims of the regime by committing $100,000 to it. John Rustad, and the BC Conservatives are not the same as the federal Conservatives. Okay. And he has not been here for that community, for our community. And I really worry about that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for organizers. It's okay. Sorry, David. This is a story of more of the same, and as the one financial expert up here, I'll, I'm going to prognosticate what's going on. Okay, we've got uh, we've got a government that's hostile to business. It doesn't want petroleum. It's very difficult to get mining. And I've worked with the executives and talked with the executives in the forest industry. They're shifting their business to the U.S. Southeast. Without the resource sector, we lose 70% of our export economy, which is 60 billion dollars a year. 
Fortis already has 23% carbon tax. When we double it in the next two years, it'll go to 46% carbon tax. Our fuel is already 45% tax. It's going to be north of 50% tax when we go and double the carbon tax. BC Hydro is sitting on $30 billion of debt because of the 100% electrification program. BC Hydro is going to finish off more likely around 40 to 50 billion. This government is on track to $200 billion of debt between the wholly owned Crown Corporations and itself. So that is, means every single one of you is going to owe about $50,000 each. And what that's going to do is that's going to drive up housing costs and construction costs. It's going to drive the youth out of this province. It is going to drive business out of it. And last week, 40, what was it? It was 63% of businesses are evaluating leaving British Columbia because we have bureaucracy, taxation, and it's oppressive to work here because of the NDP. We need to start fundamentally restructuring, and there is a lot of money that can be released in much more optimized infrastructure management and fiscal discipline in this government. A part of the 2025 budget, they have $100 million of operating costs in the legislature. They've jacked it up to $130 million. I've gone through the budget, and the budget has money embedded all the way through it. This is a government that is bloated. It's added 110,000 people in the last five years. There needs to be some leaning of this such that people can live here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I've learned a lot here today, uh, about the, particularly about the Iranian Canadian community. So I'm going to speak to voters in West Van Cita Sky, of which there are, are there any? <laughs> Put up your hand. Uh, if you are, thank you. You have a clear choice for this election. We've, we've had two big political parties in this province for a long time. They spent a lot of time arguing, uh, sometimes name calling. You've heard about what terrible people John Rustad and David Eby are. Uh, and they, they deal in fear of what happens if we elect the other. They trade power back and forth and undo a lot of the work that each other's done. And in reality, they're not that different from each other. Greens will be there to hold these two parties accountable and to get them talking to, to each other again so we can collaborate and find real solutions for people. We've been through a pandemic and a resulting economic shock and we need to stabilize our economy then grow a clean green economy that will be even more prosperous and healthy than anything we've known in the past. True fiscal responsibility is looking to the horizon, setting the conditions and sending the signals that allow the private sector, the public sector and the nonprofit sectors to do what they do best so that government can get out of the way. Fiscal responsibility is not ignoring climate change. We need to keep working hard on other challenges, as we, as we mentioned. We can elect a handful of Greens to find solutions that the, to these problems that are grounded in science and not ideology and not partisan politics. Same time, we need to keep our eye on climate solutions. We can make a smooth energy transition if we stop subsidizing polluting fossil fuels, encourage innovation, and look to the future. So this election, I encourage you to vote for what you want, sir, and elect the first BC Green MLA on the, on the mainland. You can vote green for regional transit, green economy, healthy people on a healthy planet. As your elected representative, I'll be there to hold the government and the opposition accountable and reach across the political divide in both directions and my time is up, to find evidence-based and innovative solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was invited to an all-party debate last week, which I was really impressed about because uh, being an independent, and it was a provincial one, and at the end of it, some people came up to me and they said, why are you the only person that doesn't sound mad when you speak? So um, I am in a unique position, uh, and this is a very unique opportunity in terms of provincial politics. Um, should I be elected, I could potentially have the ability with one or two of my colleagues to hold the balance of power in the legislature. Um, what has happened now, and I'll tell you why I'm here, why I'm standing in front of you, is I was first elected in this riding as a BC Liberal, um, and which became BC United, and then you've all seen the news and you know what happened with that, but I have always been a centrist. I am a fiscally conservative, socially committed 
person who I think represents the majority of British Columbians who aren't an extreme on one side or an extreme on the other side. And it's important that we have that kind of vote or that kind of um, perspective in the legislature. Uh, with the demise of BC United, I no longer had anybody to vote for in my own community. There was no one I could vote for in this riding. And it was the same with my family and my friends. I was contacted by people People, not just in this community but all across British Columbia saying what happened four people in a back room one weekend decided what the future of British Columbia is going to look like for the next decade and that is not right that's not democracy we lost the middle there was a hollowing out of the middle and we need to make sure that that voice is felt in the and heard in the legislature someone like me can help to keep the wheels on the bus so that I can support policies that I believe are are important that I believe represent our community and our province regardless of what side of the house that policy comes from so I hope you can appreciate listen to the media they think I have a good chance here and please support me <laughs> First of all, merci for being and staying, listening to all of us. We are all here on the North Shore because we value our quality of life and our freedoms. The most important thing to note today is that the NDP and the Independent who has been in the opposition for four years have ruined our economy and credit rating, run up the largest debt in BC history, has destroyed our healthcare system, has underfunded our education system, and has stopped listening to our people. Oh, except for the last two weeks. Now they are listening. A vote for the NDP, a vote for the independent, or a vote for more of the same and worse. A vote for the Conservatives is for change, positive change. My friends know me, including Corinne, to be a moderate. Yes, I am. Reasonable listener. As a 30-year educator and a six-year elected trustee, I'd like to think that my record speaks for itself. I hope I've earned your trust and your vote today for myself and for our Conservative Party, which, based on recent Main Street polling, will have the power to remove this government. Lim Block, BC Conservative, candidate for West Van Capilano. Merci. Woo. There's a lot of noise in this election right now. Left, right, radical extreme, socialist, capitalist, a lot of anger at John Rustad. Oh, sure, yeah. Start again. Is it better now? Yeah. yeah. So, a lot of noise, like I was saying. You know, left, right, socialist, capitalist, are so much noise in the media about this election. But if you take away all the noise away, this election comes down to one very simple choice. Do we want more of the same, or is it now time for a change? A friend of mine told me that if, I'm, if I want to defeat the NDP, all I have to do is tell the truth. And the truth is that the NDP has now been in government for seven years. They inherited a very strong economy with a budget surplus and very cleverly found a way to get us to a provincial debt of 130 billion and no net new private sector job growth. They took a healthcare system with long wait times in 2017 and found a creative way to make them an even longer wait time. Our, um, our drug crisis right now is now the shame of the world. Rents for an average one-bedroom apartment has doubled since 2017. The results are clear. The NDP policies have failed you and me on the economy, they've failed you and me on housing, they've failed you and me on healthcare, and they've certainly failed you and me on transportation, despite the multifaceted transportation approach that my colleague was referring to, Traffic now is way worse on the North Shore than it ever was. So, it's time to acknowledge that the experiment has failed 
it's time to move on and it's time to stop making decisions based on ideology and start making them on evidence. I think my time is up. And that is what I will leave you with right now. Thank you. I'm going to say my closing statement in Farsi. Um, but I'm going to say that I'm going کسایی که توی این اتاق هستن یه چیزی نوشته بودم و میخوام از تای قلبم باهاتون صحبت بکنم یکی این که چرا باید به من رأی بدین من از کودکی برای کامیونیتی سرویس کردم خانم نسرون فیسو اونجا شاهد هستش که من چقدر والنتیر کردم برای کامیونیتی من برای خان... کامیونیتی ایرانی چیکار کردم اولین نظر سنجی ایرانی و با هالیبرن کار کردم که ببینن که چجوری خانم های ایرانی میتونن بهتر حمایت بشن و به خاطر این یه دونه سپورت سرویس دارن توی پلیس که فارسی زبان هستش کانسلر گذاشتن که فارسی زبان هستش هیچ وقت این نشده بود که, که من من باعث شدم که بشه و همین سرویسی که توی کامیونیتی میدم میخوام بیام جلو و برای کامیونیتی کار بکنم من چیزی ندارم که تبلیغ بکنم یا چیزی ندارم که میخوام بفروشم واقعا میخوام برای کامیونیتی کار بکنم و یکی از خیلی از بنچ ها بپرسن که خب شما چرا من بعد به یه دونه ایرانی دیگه رای بدم اینو میخواستم بهتون بگم من امروز توی اجمان ویلیج بودم یه کسی با ماشینش داشت رد میشد گفت ما ایرانی نمیخوام اینجا من وقتی میرم دور نامکی میگم ما جمعیت نمیخوایم اینجا اگه میخوایم ایرانی ببینیم میریم تو کوکو اندلام نمیخوایم ایرانی ها بیشتر بشن اینجا این واقعیته میگم که میخوایم پلیس میگم میخوایم دکترای ایرانی ها بذاریم تو سیستم اون میگن که بلدن بلدن حرف بزنن انگلیسی اما لحجه دارن میخوام بهشون میگم که ما بهترین دکترای دنیا رو داریم چرا نباید اینجا بتونیم با کار بکنیم right? شاید به من بگن که خب تو تو حزب هستی هر چی حزب میگه باید گوش کنی کی گفته اینو من یه زن ایرانی هستم از زن زندگی آزادی اومدم من هیچ مشکلی ندارم به حزب جلوش وایسم اگه چیزی برای کامیونیتی مفید نیست من هیچ مشکلی ندارم که ابجکشن بکنم و به کامیونیتی ما حرف بکنم حرف گوش کنم و این کارو بکنم این که این کسای فقط یه چیزی بگم تا وقتی که یه کسی از ایرانی نره بالا توی ممبر پارلمنت بشه دولت اینجا بشه ایرانی ها, اینا ایرانی ها رو اینجا سیریسلی نمیگیرن و بعد این کار رو بکنیم که یه ایرانی بره بالا که بهشون نشون بدیم ما اینجا هستیم و میمونیم Several times they raise their hand, they have a question. I just wonder, I know we are need to finish that. Uh, closing a statement is done, but do, do we have a time for two ladies in the front? They ask the question. Okay, yes, please. Thank you. You want to start it? Um, I can pass to you, maybe. Okay. And can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, actually, Madam Ma, my question was for you. I'm pretty sure you're going to have a statement or not answering my question anyway i decided to ask the one that is most important to me and the iranian canadian citizen of the north shore uh, and i'm seeking a detailed answer about this question if you can do that i've spoken with several north vancouver rcmp officers who are concerned that adp government particularly yourself madame ma may retaliate against them for expressing their view on public safety. Many of them feel their ability to perform their duties is being compromised by fear of political consequences. Thank you. Voila. Thank you so much for your question. I have a, a pretty good working relationship with the North Vancouver RCMP and I can honestly say I've never had this concern raised to me by any specific officers or even their, their seniors. So if there's somebody in particular uh, that 
uh, you, you are concerned about or that you're hearing this yes. from, uh, because we actually value very much the work of the North Vancouver RCMP here. Just yesterday, I was standing with the North Vancouver RCMP at the Truth and Reconciliation event over in Central Lonsdale, uh, hand in hand, t uh, talking about the importance of acknowledging the truth of uh, in, of um, residential schools. Madam, you're the suing them. Uh, they can't tell you. You're suing them. I'm you're suing them. You're NDP suing them. Can you answer my question? Yeah. Can I bring proof? So to you? I can. What I can say is, uh, with all absolute uh, firmness and 100% confidence, I am not suing any uh, any okay. other RCMP officers or any police officers. I'm not engaged in any lawsuits right now that I'm. Can involved. you have a live conversation and bring up those people to ask their question to you, live? Front of people. Can what I'm concerned about right now is there are a lot of allegations being being made here that I have no background you history. No, everyone they can't talk in social so media with you. I am. Not I am one aware. of the victim in North Vancouver because you're supporting those. I'm people. very sorry that you're a victim. I do not know you. Um, you this know is me. the first time that I have seen you before. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what you're looking for from me, except I can absolutely confirm I'm not engaged in any lawsuits that I'm aware of. I'm not saying lawsuits, but you didn't okay. answer again the question anyway. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you for your question. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for everyone. Uh, just uh, the only thing, let's just a ask the question that is related to the election. So it's uh, really important. I know that it's part of the concern. It's part of the concern for the community, but let's just ask questions that's related to the election at the moment, because the lack of the time, of course, of course. And I'm sure that Ms. Ma is going to uh, respond after, because right now that is, uh, of course, I'm, I'm sure. Thank you. So next question, please. Thank you. All right. My question is also for COVID mom. I am a woman, mother of two girls. We are all dual Canadian Iranian citizens. I'm a proud supporter of Jewish people and the state of Israel. Your former party colleague, Selena Robinson, stated in her resignation letter to the party that not one party member contacted her or spoke out in support of her. As someone who spoke out loud and clear when a wrong was committed against you, why did you not speak out loud and clear for Selena? And secondly, Jewish and Iranians in your community are being harassed and targeted by members of the Islamic regime in Iran within your writing. Besides a token memorial, what actions did you take to protect your constituents? Wow. Thank you. It is incredibly important that if somebody is targeted in any way by anybody, if you are being harassed, if you are being assaulted, if you are the focus of any kind of attack, please, please report it to the police. The police in North Vancouver are incredible. They work hard, they care about the community, they take investigations seriously. These. This is what's important here in, in North Vancouver. It's incredibly important that everybody feels safe. But what is not acceptable is vigilante justice. It is not acceptable to take matters into your own hands. That can lead to extremely serious consequences within our community and divides within our community. So by supporting one another, one of the ways we support one another is that we act as witnesses during police investigations. The, the, the behavior that you are describing, if somebody is being attacked, they need to go to the police. Please, please encourage them to do so. Any comment on Selena? Oh, of course, sorry, your, your question was so long. Everybody deserves to feel safe in their communities. And again, similarly, if they're being attacked for being Jewish, if you are being attacked for being Muslim, if you are being attacked for any kind of, any kind of, uh, I guess, uh, aspect of yourself that uh, is not related to an action, this is what 
Canada is about, you are meant to be safe here regardless of where you come from, regardless of your religious background, regardless of the socioeconomic status of your family. It's incredibly important. I, I'm sorry, I... I didn't understand the question. No. The question was, you support may Selena? I repeat it then? The question was, why did you not support Selena Robinson? Selena was an incredibly important member of our team. And we had many conversations as a team with her as well. But some of the comments that she had made created division within our community and were unacceptable. And because we, are, it is incredibly important to us that people who are Palestinian, that people who are Jewish, that people who are Muslim feel safe practicing their own religion and, and being proud of where they come from here. It is, that is what is important here. Okay. Thanks to all the audience for today. And thanks to the candidates, the respected candidates, all thank you. Thanks for uh, the time uh, for everyone. And um, I wanted to uh, uh, just wish the best for all candidates. And please remember, when you, uh, whoever going to win, please support us as the community uh, for the, just the Canadian Iranian from community that has been uh, here or uh, just in the service of the community for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, thank you again. And I would like just to um, also uh, thanks to everyone, Ms. Nasrin Filsu, which, which is the founder of the community. And all the other uh, directors that uh, unfortunately haven't been here. And a special thanks to Kami that always, always great support to this uh, foundation. Thank you again, everyone. And all this, right? Of course, thanks. Uh, <laughs> yes, thanks, Mr. Maichi, which um, always, uh, also that's a great support for all community with uh, Parvas TV, uh, which is the Persian uh, TV. Uh, that's always, uh, it's the sound of the Persian here in uh, Vancouver. Thanks again. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the Sunday.